Hello, everyone, and welcome to this SMS panel on corporate adjustment. I'm Sandra Corredor. I am a teaching assistant professor at the Geese College of Business. And today we have three brilliant scholars that will allow us to start a conversation about corporate adjustment. So uh, they have agreed to present some of the research, uh, which is a great conversation starter, but we really hope that you participate uh, when they have finished uh, presenting their, their view. Uh, and we appreciate everyone being here. So we have Tim Folta, the Thomas, John, and Beth Wolf family chair in strategic entrepreneurship at the University of Connecticut. We will also have Joe Mahoney, who is the Caterpillar chair at the Geese College of Business at the University of Illinois. And we will also have Brian Wu, who is the Michael R. and Mary K. Hallman fellow at the Ross Business School at the University of Michigan. So without any intention of taking any more time from our panelists, uh, let's start with Team Falta. Okay, well, thank you. It's an honor to, to be on the panel, uh, especially with Brian and, and Joe. Um, you know, I thought it would be <laughs> timely to talk about the pand pandemic and, and lots of people think about, you know, the topic of corporate adjustment is pretty broad and mine may be more narrow um, than many, but, uh, but I'm going to talk about it in the context of resource redeployment to a new domain. And um, there have been some interesting uh, corporate adjustments uh, during the pandemic. Uh, some may be more obvious than others. You know, for example, Uber, Uber drivers uh, uh, reallocating their efforts towards Uber Eats, um, delivering food and, and so forth. Um, we've got companies like the big auto manufacturers, Ford and GM and Volvo, VW, that have gotten into making ventilators um, uh, Volvo has also used their, their supply chain to deliver food and, and equipment, um, interestingly. Uh, Anheuser-Busch uh, and Pug and uh, LVMH, so, you know, the latter, latter two are perfume makers, are making uh, hand sanitizers and disinfectants. Um, and so uh, one way to think about these sorts of redeployments, especially the non-Uber redeployments, is that they're merely acting altruistically to, to help society. Uh, so in, in my short presentation, I'd like to present a, a different framework that might explain these extreme adjustments. And I, I think they also have, uh, the framework also has potency to explain corporate adjustments more generally. So, um, you know, we know that adjusting resources for a new use involves adjustment costs, whether it be retraining employees or altering production or service processes. These costs represent irreversible investments and degrees of adjustment affect the level of investment irreversibility. And, and this is important because the sunk costs associated with investment or divestment have a big effect on whether a firm will invest or divest. For example, higher levels of adjustment costs uh, will raise um, uh, raise the investment, you know, the, the redeployment threshold. The implication is that with more adjustment firms require higher expected profits before they're willing to invest. Another implication is that this should influence to which, to which use they adjust their resources, where they prefer lower levels of adjustment, holding all else equal. You know, in a similar way, uh, adjustment costs influence divestment. Uh, if resources in their next best use require a lot of adjustment, they'll be reticent to divest because any desire to reinvest in the same opportunity would require reincurring uh, adjustment costs. So this seems pretty obvious, I suppose, but it's fundamental because it invites a theory of the firm uh, scope 
that differs from the traditional way strategists think about diversification. Uh, that is through the lens of simultaneous sharing of resources. And, and, and this theory that I'm describing now speaks specifically to situations where resources cannot be used simultaneously. Um, they have to be used in market A or market B, but not both. So now this view of, of redeployment is a bit incomplete because the alternative to redeployment is using the external market to invest or divest resources. So it must be the case that the external transaction costs exceed internal redeployment costs. Otherwise, firms should use the external market. So let me provide some examples that go beyond the pandemic uh, and use some of the research that I'm, I'm doing on this, this topic. Okay. So this is um, an example that comes from a paper with my colleague Timo Sol. Um, and uh, we're studying the retail industry. Uh, my first foray into retail, but, but so you've got Inditex on the right and they're a multi-business firm, multi-chain firm. And they've got, uh, they've got stores in many, many different countries. Uh, two of their chains are Pull and Bear and Zara. Now H&M at one point, I think they're multi-chain now, but at one point they were a single chain store. And so uh, let's, um, um, let's say that uh, one of the pull and bear stores in downtown Barcelona uh, is not performing very well. Uh, what, are, what, what are the alternatives for Inditex? You know, they could, they could sell the store uh, and um, uh, reinvest that cash, or they can redeploy the store to Zara, uh, uh, who, who has a similar set of uh, buildings and, and uh, has a similar use for these buildings. H&M doesn't have that alternative. So, uh, so they have to divest the store and get rid of it. Um, so this is at the store level. You know, the, the paper with Timo uh, looks at exit uh, at the country level. So the, the theory has potential to explain exit. Um, and this would suggest that Inditex is going to exit businesses more quickly than, than H&M might. Or, sing, uh, or sim, single business, single business firm. Another another example: uh, the Del Hayes Group owns a, a number of different uh, stores in, in the grocery business, and in the U.S. they had five brands, and they're all pretty similar types of stores. Uh, and uh, evidently, the Bloom chain was performing poorly. Um, uh, at one point in time, so they decided to reallocate. Uh, these stores to Food Lion. They sold some, but they also re redeployed others. Uh, and, um, and so I think one of the takeaways here is that the redeployment costs were relatively low in both the Zara and the, in this case here that I'm showing you now, because the, the, the store formats were similar. You know, if the, if the, the store formats were different, uh, the redeployment costs would be a lot higher and the, the ability to redeploy cost effectively uh, would, be, would be lower. Um, uh, so let me provide some other uh, evidence. So the story, the story that I just told you a minute ago is about exit uh, and, and or entry uh, into a market. Uh, you don't necessarily, uh, re it doesn't necessarily need to be the case that exit or entry uh, occur simultaneous to redeployment. You could actually partially uh, withdraw resources or partially um, uh, deploy resources in new markets. And, and what I want to show you here is a CompuSat, CompuSat sample uh, comparing multi-business firm segments with single business firms. And, and one of the implications of this theory, we think, is that firms should, um, uh, we, should see, uh, we should see more fluidity in how firms allocate their resources across their businesses. In other words, we should see more variance in their, in their revenues or their, their, you know, their asset size or, or whatever, more variance in general. And so with this sample of CompuStat firms, 
when we looked over 15 or 20 years, we see that the standard deviation of revenue growth is a lot higher. And this is a matched sample, by the way, uh, where we uh, take essentially similar segments. Um, uh, and we can see that the standard deviation is a lot higher. We also kind of divided the sample into, well, let's just look at expansions, instances where, where uh, segments expanded. And then on, the, on the, the other side, let's look at instances where they, where they uh, retrenched. And more specifically, you can see that expansion uh, in multi-business firm segments was, was higher. Uh, and that's a, that's a significant difference. And retrenchment is even an even bigger difference. So there, it seems that the ability uh, or the proclivity to expand or retrench in multi-business firm segments is quite a bit higher than in single business firms. So this is some evidence that this partial redeployment story is occur occurring and that corporations seem to have uh, this ability to redeploy re resources across their portfolio. Uh, and single business firms don't have that same degree of flexibility. Um, one of the things I'm encouraged about is that there seem to be a lot of, a lot of good people working in this area. And I, I know that some of them are on the line right now and, so, and, and some are fellow panelists here. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a re young research scholar uh, thinking about a dissertation uh, topic, you know, I think it's, you know, one of my bits of advice to those scholars is you want to work in a hot area. Uh, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to come too late to the game, of course, but, uh, but the, the fact that there seem to be some pretty high quality people working in this space is, is interesting. I don't mean to just talk about the names. I, you know, if, if you're interested, I could talk more generally about these, more specifically about these these specific studies. But there seems to be some momentum around the topic here, and this is what I wanted to convey: is look at you know, look at the number of papers, and I'm, I, there, I know there's a number of working papers with young scholars that are doing dissertation on this topic, um, and so I'm I'm encouraged encouraged by that. Um, so one of the things Sandra asked us to consider was what are the what are the potential research areas that are worth exploring, and you know um, I hope more ideas come out during our discussion. But here's a few that that I've thought about. You know, one is um, resource adjustment costs. Are they the same across resources? You know, for example, you know the so if if you have to retrain uh, employees. Um, you know, is that a, is that a, you know, is that a sunk cost? Uh, you know, if you, if you exit a particular business and decide to re-enter, will you have to retrain those employees, uh, back to their original use? It's not obvious to me that that's the case. Even, even if you take equipment or a, a building, if you, if you if you refurbish a building or, or reorient equipment for use, I can see how you definitely have to reincur the cost of changing it back. But that may not be the case for human capital. So it may not be clear that that adjustment costs or the degree of irreversibility associated with adjustment costs is the same for each type of resource. And I don't think any study has has really investigated that to any great extent. Um, uh, this topic of resource bundles is of tremendous interest to me, but, you know, in, in my crude approaches to study this topic, we tend to just look at single resource or we, we consider, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a segment or a, a business is having a, a single resource and, and how costly is it to adjust that single resource when in fact some, some resources need to be bundled. Or you know their 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 efficiency or effectiveness in an alternative use goes up when it is bundled, and so that that's going to change the calculus somewhat. And I don't think anybody's worked through uh, the details as to how it changes. So that's that's worth studying. Another thing that this pandemic, uh, this last bullet point, uh, pertains to the first slide that I showed you, and that is 
you know, our current characterization suggests that, you know, if, if the, the payoff to adjusting uh, exceeds the adjustment costs, it, it might make sense to do that. Um, well, you know, how do we think about payoffs? You know, um, if GM and Ford did not, did not start making ventilators, you know, the, the negative impact might have been pretty great. Uh, moreover, you know, some of these firms were acting altruistically and, um, and they saw that as a, you know, as a net win to their stakeholder base. And, and, and given, the, given the importance of, of uh, stakeholders, um, uh, it's worth, and Joe can comment on this probably much more effectively than, than I can, but it's worth adding this uh, into our calculus. Um, uh, so those are a few thoughts about how this, um, uh, what I think is kind of an interesting and fascinating uh, new way to think about the determinants of firm scope. Um, uh, how, that, these are a few ways that I've been thinking about it. And I look forward to the discussion uh, with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, team. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. And as I mentioned, please feel free to pose your questions in the chat feature. Uh, we will open uh, the discussion once uh, all the, the panelists has finish, have finished presenting. So next, Joe Mahoney will present uh, on his corporate adjustment session. So let me share the screen for you, Joe. <clears throat> and thank you everyone for uh, being here today for the session and uh, thank you Tim for your presentation and congratulations on your uh, forthcoming article in uh, SMJ and uh, very nice empirical results uh, uh, in uh, your fourth paper. Uh, I guess next slide. So uh, Sandra, in uh, sending out a note to us all, uh, uh, to, to uh, Brian and Tim and I, uh, part of her, her, uh, her message to us was uh, a focus on understanding how firms can overcome inertia and adjust to new factors and product market positions, outline major determinants of adjustment costs and approaches to accelerate uh, corporate adjustments. So that uh, will be the focus of the Yeah, so uh, this is a work uh, with a uh, doctoral student, Geese uh, College of Business, Han Su Lee and, and myself. And, and the, the paper is on firm level experimentation and the focus is on joining the adjustment cost literature in which I've done some work with uh, Nick Bargeris and Jackson Nickerson uh, with some uh, work on uh, real options uh, theory, which uh, I've uh, done some work with, uh, particularly with over with Yang Li in that area. So in bringing these two together, despite the potential headway in joining adjustment costs and real options, these literatures, for the most part, have been in their respective silos. So the bridging concept that uh, we use in our paper to join adjustment costs and real options is through the construct of firm level experimenta experimentation, which of course is getting a lot of attention now in the strategy field, although I would point out that uh, since so many people are worried about endogeneity problems, kind of the gold standard is the controlled experiment and then the quasi, -exper the quasi uh, uh, experiment or the quasi controlled experiment uh, through uh, different types of econometric endogeneity uh, procedures along those lines. So our construct that then is uh, a really key idea is firm level experimentation uh, to join adjustment costs and real options. And then a particular connection that we would want to make too is to the Nelson Winter book. Matter of fact, Richard Nelson, I would say throughout his career, uh, one of the linchpins of, of much of his theorizing in many of his papers is the importance of experimentation. So we can take this quote from the book society ought to be engaging in experimentation. The information and feedback from that experimentation are a central concern in guiding the evolution of the economic system. Okay, next slide. Okay, so another uh, terrific writer in the history of social science is uh, Nathan Rosenberg, and so in his work on technology, 
And his comment in 1992 is experimentation enables the firm to gain information which, quote, cannot be known in advance or deduced from some set of first principles. It's kind of an, perhaps an, an Austrian economics or, or at least related to an Austrian economics perspective. So with a set of assumptions and hypotheses of key parameters of the business, a firm then engage, engages in this iterative experimentation to look at sources of sustainable competitive advantage in a highly uncertain or turbulent environment. So we provide uh, in our paper just uh, the, the experimentation process that we envision uh, with uh, hypothesis development, design, action, the experimentation, identifying causal relationships, and then all that feeds into the strategic plan of the company. Okay, next slide. So while experimentation uh, provides a firm of many potential benefits, as recent papers have emphasized, it also entails coordination and motivation costs. So, uh, so NPV, of course, is the benefits minus the costs. And here we're focusing a lot on the adjustment cost of coordination and motivation. In addition, conducting an experiment might disclose information to the market, and that can be another cost of a, a, for imitation risk. So while the literature often acknowledges the various costs of experimentation, we have little systematic knowledge about the sources of the adjustment costs that a firm faces when experimenting. And further, as discussed elsewhere, we need to understand how comparative adjustment costs at individual and organizational levels influence the amount and form of the experimentation. So uh, what we propose is uh, a COPE framework, and of course COPE is about adjusting. So in, in COPING, if we, if we look at the literature, uh, the, the, there's four uh, buckets, if you will, that you can put much of the literature on an adjustment cost into. The, if you want to see a connection to where this comes from, is uh, if you were to go back to the Allison book on the essence of decision, the, the first model is the rational actor model. That would be economic. The, the second model of, is the, uh, of Allison is the organizational model. And the third model is political. But interesting enough, Allison really doesn't discuss cognition at all. So then if you put the, 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 the uh, Allison three models plus cognition, you get these four. And then it just uh, it occurred to us that we could call that cope, which is kind of like adjusting. So if you look at the literature, there's lots of stuff about what are some cognitive factors, but this all goes all the way back to Herbert Simon discussing, uh, matter of fact, March and Simon in their 58 book, if I, if I recall correctly, actually used the term uh, a psychological sunk cost. So the psychological sunk cost are the blind spots, the cognitive inertia, the managerial hubris. We also have, a, a, through our, our connections and strategy to, to our colleagues in organization theory, Lots of discussions on uh, on established routines and the inertia there, the organizational structure, rigid communication channels, uh, politics, uh, like Di Figueredo and others looking at internal political frictions. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Nickerson and Zenger uh, looking at uh, jealousy and envy. And then uh, Ramelt has a paper on inertia uh, from 1995 where he referred to political deadlocks. And of course, we're, we're probably strongest in the strategy field on the economic side of adjustment costs, where the incentive structures can uh, be impediments to change the co-specialized assets, uh, going back to the Hellfat and Eisenhart on intertemporal and intra, uh, intra uh, interproject spillovers, and then contractual commitments is kind of a, uh, a bedrock idea within the strategy field about potential uh, impediments to change. And next slide. And then experimentation then requires a reassessment and redistribution of firms internal resources. The firms engage in experimentation to redefine their purposes and to reallocate uh, different firms that uh, have different uh, differential adjustment costs. And then what our paper is trying to contribute is that the, the, that the, the rich literature we have in the strategy field on, you know, when people keep asking where these adjustment costs come from. Well, the, the point to make is that if we actually collect the uh, excellent literature we already have, that we have cognitive, organizational, political, and economic uh, uh, scholars within the strategy field that really provide the, uh, the, the, the foundations for that framework. 
Okay, and the next one, next slide. So then, uh, don't have time to go into the details of defending all these propositions. We'll just give them to you now because I want to make sure uh, Brian has uh, plenty of time to present and we'll have Q&A afterwards. But uh, th through this framework, then, uh, we kind of connect the experimentation framework that's uh, the first part with this cognitive framework with the impediments. And we join those two together for the adjustment costs and experimentation to come up with the following proposition. So our first one is firms with comparatively lower adjustment costs are more likely to engage in internal experimentation. Won't go through all the details of the literature, uh, kind of the, the, some of the material by Leonard Barton, some of the material uh, by Granovetter on embeddedness and so forth. So the second proposition is that, that, that firms with comparative or comparatively lower adjustment costs are, or, are also more likely to engage in collaborative experimentation. Now note, note that the, while the, there could be similarities in the propositions empirically, uh, there's still a question about whether all of these uh, will, will pan out in, uh, when we do empirical tests. In other words, you could have some propositions when they're converted into hypotheses will be corroborated and others may be falsified. But these are the, 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 the propositions to consider. Okay, next one. So proposition three has to do with uh, looking at uh, diverse experimentation. And once again, we would argue that firms with comparatively lower adjustment costs are more likely to engage in diverse experimentation as well. In fact, uh, Will Ocasio, just uh, Will, Will Ocasio uh, uh, is uh, now at Illinois to, to, to those who uh, that, that will be news to. Probably not very many people these days. But in fact, the other, the other thing that is news is he's a neighbor right up, my, right up the street. Uh, the fourth proposition is uh, that firms with greater experimentation experience are more likely to learn more from their subsequent experimentation. So. So uh, I guess another site that probably would connect here too would be kind of the, the Cohen and Leventhal work on uh, the more R&D that you do, the more absorptive capacity you have and the more benefits you get from the experimentation. So that's uh, kind of related to this idea of uh, looking at the experimentation experience itself as influencing the learning. Okay, next. Then we have uh, some of the work, uh, I think a really uh, a terrific paper in the literature is the, the 2001 organization science uh, paper. In fact, Bruce Kogut was on my dissertation committee from many years ago. And then also uh, Ned Bowman was on my dissertation committee too. So I guess kind of influenced by my mentors from the past. So I, I think it's really helpful to think about the building of capabilities and real options experience as being a, a type of uh, dynamic capability or just the capability. Uh, and so the, the, the fifth proposition is, is an increase in experimentation enables more firm level real options because you, 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 you'll ha as you do the experiment, you'll uh, the data are never given. Uh, the, the, the data are de depend upon the richness of the organizations who who, uh, who in interpret the data and get meaning from the data. And for those firms that do more experimentation, the idea is, is, is that uh, as they do the experiments and they learn more, uh, that they also can then envision uh, more uh, firm level real options. That's the fifth one. Okay, the, the sixth uh, proposition is that as, as we increase the situation specific knowledge gained when you exercise the multiple portfolio of the real options, that that actually has a feedback effect of uh, leading to lower uh, adjustment costs. And then to the next. So then this gives kind of the, the full model of the, the way we're thinking of, of joining the uh, recent discussions on experimentation, the ideas on on uh, adjustment costs and, and connecting it to real options. So the, the base of the framework is that we have, uh, from the literature, we have cognitive, organizational, political, and economic factors 
that lead to low uh, adjustment costs. Those low adjustment costs then mean there's a lower cost of experimentation. Because you have more experimentation then, that the more experimentation then leads to more real options. And real options itself, as, uh, as the organization science paper has noted, is the real options itself as a type of capability. And so that kind of leads back to proposition six is that the more real options can actually lower the adjustment cost. So basically we kind of have a, a, a kind of a virtuous circle, if you will, of the low, the low adjustment costs lead to experimentation. The experimentation leads to an increase in real options. And then the real options has a feedback effect of also lowering the adjustment cost. So maybe it is a story of for firms that the, that the, uh, the richer learning firms get richer over time provided there's not a paradigm shift, by the way. Uh, so, so then in terms of the contribution, we see our, uh, Hun Su Lee and I see our paper as providing, uh, building, building on the, the, the momentum of recent discussions on experimenting organizations. So we're proposing a purposeful firm level experimentation as a strategy that firms can use to adopt to accelerate corporate adjustment. So the COPE framework provides useful implications for building an experimenting organization where idea generation, learning and adaptation are nurtured. Uh, the second uh, literature is to the real options literature via the adjustment costs and experimentation. So our framework suggests that the generation of useful options is typically initiated by small investments, like small wins. And a small wins are a type of real option or a type of experimentation that enable a firm to gain more knowledge. A firm's differential adjustment cost then can lead to different firm level experimentation, which can result differentially in the availability of real options, which, has, which are also a type of capability. So then we're suggesting that uh, within our literature that we don't think of these things in silos, particularly when we're teaching managers, that there are positive feedback loops that real options create, decreasing the level of the adjustment cost, which can then be one of the underpinning mechanisms to explain why real options provide a firm of greater flexibilities. So what we see in our, in our papers, there's a lot of wonderful things going on in our field. And I, I think the next generation of, of research needs to not think of these things as separate islands, but but in some sense, uh, we're trying to make, suggesting there are one continent for providing uh, insights uh, for both researchers to empirically test and for, and for us to be um, relevant when we're teaching executives in the class. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. So now, uh, we, we, we have very interesting questions in the chat, so we will address it right after Brian's presentation. So Brian, please. I need to unmute. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra, once again uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a truly an honor and a privilege to be on the same panel as uh, Tim and uh, Joe. Uh, it's truly an honor. I, uh, as they say, uh, grew up reading their work you know, as a scholar. Um, so I actually uh, very uh, religiously followed Sandra's instruction, right? So how the current pandemic can impact the adjustment of a company, right? So, uh, so that's uh, you know, my uh, uh, agenda for, for today, not about a particular paper, but just uh, some observations. So the first uh, example uh, is, is um, uh, you know, this company called uh, Dig's Sporting Goods, right? So, uh, it, it, you know, before pandemic, right? So the company almost dying, you know, uh, the, the first quarter of 2020, uh, you know, I think that's sales, right? Yes, quarterly revenue dropped by 30%. And then afterward, you know, after pandemic, uh, you know, the, the, becoming surprisingly fit. So uh, actually, I was surprised because I uh, significantly reduced my uh, exercises, you know, during pandemic, right? So <laughs> to ask me whether I continue running, <laughs> actually, I gained uh, almost 15 pounds uh, during pandemic because I 
stopped uh, exercising. I kept asking Tim how he always looks so fit. I mean, you know, so, uh, so that's why if I were banking on, uh, on investment, right, uh, I would actually have bad, oh, you know, this kind of a uh, company like a Dick's Sporting Goods uh, with a further decline. But again, uh, to me, it was a surprise, right? So the uh, revenue actually uh, increased uh, quite a bit. So I, I can, you know, I, you know, I then read this article from uh, Wall Street Journal, right? So I mean, then I understood better. And so yes, a lot of weaknesses in terms of team sports, you know, and the challenge from online retailers, etc. But you know, because of pandemic, right? So enthusiasm for at-home fitness, outdoor activities, right, significantly increasing, and, and that kind of a contrast with, let's say, Brooks Brothers, right? So I bet many of us now are not really wearing formal pants, right? I, I, I'm betting, you know, <laughs> even though, you know, we wear shirts, you know, the, the suits, uh, uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the demand is shifting, right? So I mean, that, that's the key point. The key point here is that even though you aggregate, pandemic is a negative shock, right? Uh, the composition of demand in different, um, in the economy, right? Across different industries. And in fact, even within the same industry, and in fact, within the same firm, right? There is a lot of need for adjustment, right? To uh, Sandra's point. So, and then there is also uh, some uh, cross firm evidence from a different article uh, in Wall Street Journal. The idea is, you know, it compares sporting goods, outdoors, electronics, furniture, grocery, hardware, garden apparel, et cetera, right? Of course, I mean, this is just a kind of a, almost like an anecdote, right? In fact, that's, I'm so glad, you know, Tim presented uh, his work um, with Timo, right? So on global retail sector. So, uh, you know, I think that's the strength of uh, academic research, right? Especially this kind of a deep and rigorous research. You know, you know I, I think it's a great opportunity to really, uh, you know, compare, you know, our, uh, you know, theoretical uh, insights with the empirical reality, right? So, uh, you know, I, I'm not drawing any conclusion here, but I'm just uh, uh, highlighting the relevance uh, uh, rigorous and high quality uh, uh, scholarly research, right? So uh, again, I think, uh, you know, how they will uh, fare in the future is totally debatable. Otherwise we'll, we'll all get rich by investing or selling or shorting some stocks, right? Uh, but but, but I, think, I think this is a wonderful topic. I, I'm so glad Sandra brought this up, right? So, and organize this. Uh, uh, panel. I mean, just look at uh, all the data. I mean, it's, uh, for example, one thing I, I've been uh, fascinated about is maybe because I came from a small town. I always hope, you know, firms like, uh, you know, Walmart, right, can, can, can beat uh, Amazon, right? So that kind of thing. I mean, pandemic certainly helped uh, Amazon, uh, sorry, uh, Walmart quite a bit in part because of the offline, you know, kind of traditional uh, abilities or capabilities to adjust their operations in you know, online, offline, in the physical stores, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Again, this is just the observation. So I want to give one example, right? So how do we uh, formalize uh, this type of, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a conduct research, right? Uh, for this kind of shocks, right? And, and, and the required uh, corporate adjustment. So I, I conducted a, a, a a few papers actually with the Vika Sagawa and the several other colleagues on 9-11, on right? So that was also a big shock, at least uh, to the uh, uh, defense sector, right? So after 2000, uh, you know, the, 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 the spending, right? So in the defense sector increased uh, significantly, in part also because, you know, before, uh, 2001, you know, that, that's the end of a Cold War, right? So sort of around 1989-ish, you know, the, the uh, defense sector declined a lot of consolidation, but then, you know, demand increased. So what we found actually uh, through several papers, uh, you know, 
actually a seemingly positive, I hate to use this word, you know, or you know, increase in demand, in aggregate, you know, aggregate demand, actually sort of a beneath such increase or change in overall demand, there is a significant shift in demand compensation, right? That's an industry level situation. But the implication in the pro, uh, what Tim and Joe shared, a lot of challenges, even though it's a positive shock, a lot of challenges for adaptation, for adjustment, right? At the firm level. So we observe a lot of heterogeneity Right, so for for you know big firms, for small firms, for new entrants, uh, etc. Right, so it, it's it's fascinating. Uh, so I guess the point here is that uh, you know we we uh, as a researcher going back to Sandra's point, right. So there is a big um, change in the society and, and uh, uh, you know on the global scale, right. Uh, a lot of things will change, you know, all the way from education to retail to, you know, you name it. I think as a strategy scholar, it, it, it's almost uh, our responsibility to, to carefully study the implications, at least for corporations, right? And then, you know, based on such uh, careful research, we can hopefully draw useful implications for, let's say, entrepreneurship. Right. For example, right. So maybe incumbent firms uh, encounter uh, adaptation challenge, but you know such incumbent challenge actually create opportunity for a new firm for entrepreneur to enter. In fact, I think the recent data show that despite the pandemic, you know entrepreneur activities actually increased. Right. So that again go back to uh, Tim's uh, comment about internal adjustment versus external you know, transaction cost, the kind of thing, right? So the visible hand of market forces versus the invisible hand, uh, uh, you know, corporation, right? So uh, in, in some sense, you know, we always emphasize dynamic capabilities, but I, sometimes I say, look, I mean, the dynamic capability could be bad for society, I and mean, it's time for you to, you know, go bankrupt, right? So, uh, um, you know, I'm too extreme, but, um, the point here is that I think a lot of opportunities to consider not only adjustment within cooperation, but also in you know, the rivalry across uh, different types of firm. I, I think uh, later I'll touch upon that. I'm pretty sure you know Joe has a recent paper with uh, uh, Jackson, you know Nick, touching upon this, right? So connecting you know Porter's you know external competition with the internal adjustment. Uh, I, I, I briefly mentioned that. So I'm still conducting a survey of this line of research, right? Uh, it, it's just the beginning. Uh, I'm so glad that team already created a, a side. We didn't like coordinate, by the way, uh, so, uh, at all. So it's just, uh, I'm so glad that he already summarized the, the, the literature. It's so valuable for especially um, young scholars, right? Uh, but here, I only want to mention a few uh, papers by panelists, right? So uh, uh, Timo and uh, Tim have very nice uh, working paper, as I said, right? So evidence from the global retail sector. <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, and the market exit, you know, and it's redeployment. I think that's exactly what I showed earlier, right? The Wall Street Journal article, you know, the big sporting goods or, you know, Walmart or, you know, JC Penney, you know, all these firms, right? I think a lot of uh, uh, research opportunities here, uh, you know, expanding, you know, team, Timo and the team's work from, you know, uh, some years ago, right? So in the global retail sector, I think that challenge there very likely was uh, e-commerce, right? So, the, but now it's a pandemic, right? So, what are the implications? Likewise, I, I mentioned just now, you know, uh, uh, Nick, you know, Joe uh, Jackson, they have this very nice paper, you know, putting together, uh, you know, adjustment cost, transaction cost, and opportunity cost. Uh, also, Tim, uh, Kony, uh, Samina had this, uh, you know, uh, I think a whole issue on uh, a, a resource redeployment and, and, and adjustment, I would say, per today's topic, right? Um, and myself also, I did uh, actually my dissertation on uh, 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 opportunity cost and the uh, industry dynamics, but that used only a particular uh, industry setting, right? So, uh, medical device. Uh, uh, so that's a uh, that. Um, okay, what? Oh, that's the last slide, and then we can uh, open the floor for 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 discussion. 
as I said, you know, I, I carefully followed <laughs> uh, Sandra's instruction, right? So uh, I just, uh, you know, what what are the impact of, uh, of a pandemic on corporate adjustment? So, I mean, here for my last slide, I want to share a little bit of my, I would say, uh, lesson, right? So my own uh, experience, uh, very often frustrations, failures, right, with, with young scholars, uh, you know, in, in, in this uh, workshop, right? So, uh, I, you know, personally, as I said, you know, I did a dissertation on base. In fact, I also wrote a paper with Dan Leventhal on, you know, scale-free capabilities and opportunity costs. But my problem always is I tend to be too narrow, right? So for my entire dissertation, I was obsessed with this notion of a diversification discount. Right. I was like, you know, seriously, I mean, Penrose said diversification creates a value, but how come corporate finance scholars show that there's a discount of diversified firm, right? I, I, I try to, you know, <laughs> develop a very simple mathematical model to uh, reconcile the two. I don't want to resort to agency behavior. I don't want to resort to, you know, a behavioral thing of the firm. I just hopefully show that, you know, RBV itself can explain both decision and outcome is, is just the assessment, but it was too narrow. In fact, Joe Mahoney was the editor for, for this paper in the paper with Dan. It's so interesting. I mean, I can share with, you know, especially junior scholars, you know, almost, I think close to acceptance, Joe suggests that you should highlight this sentence. The last paragraph of your paper, you know, the notion of opportunity cost is a powerful concept, right? So to me, I was like, seriously, what's the opportunity cost? I mean, what, what kind of, you know, I, I never thought about the implications of this fundamental concept, uh, you know, for, for, for a broader set of questions, right? So for strategy research, I think our strength probably to, as I you know, put in here, to embrace new phenomena, uh, yet, you know, really always try to reinforce the theoretical foundation to provide this kind of a, Perspective. I think the team today also, right? So the adjustment cost, the, you know, real options, kind of a. Uh, I mean, one example, right? So later, I saw KD and teams work on real options. Uh, it was kind of combine my work with, uh, you know, let's say uncertainty. I was like, a, you know, hitting my head. You know, look, I missed that opportunity, right? So I only focus on let's say the change in magnitude of demand. I never thought about well. Really, I mean, yeah, 911 probably just uh, pretty sure it's increased, but pandemic it, it's pretty uncertain, right? We need experimentation, we need uh, options, we need, uh, I mean, as uh, Joe's article summarized here, you know, we need a lot of uh, a broader perspective, a wider lens in, in some sense, right? So that's uh, kind of my lesson, right? So yes, probably for dissertation uh, or particular paper, maybe useful to, to go a little deeper, but, but uh, over time, I think uh, it, it, I think advantages. Uh, I think even in terms of contributing to the field to go a little broader, I would say. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm still trying to figure out in uh, you know, my stuff. I, I'm just sharing my uh, personal journey uh, since I see uh, many um, uh, young scholars here, right? So uh, last but not least, I want to say that you know, uh, for corporate adjustment. I mean, sometimes people say that, look, I mean, this is not a hot topic. I mean, Tim said it's hot, but uh, yeah. Uh, I think hotter topics probably like, a, <laughs> you know, more sexy topics like a platform, the ecosystem, etc. But I, I say that, I mean, fundamentally, you know, if, if you go too hot, right? I mean, you kind of lose sight uh, on, on the on the core, you know, uh, the foundation or the core issues. Because I spent a year, uh, a whole year, my sabbatical uh, in, in the biggest uh, uh, ride hailing company in the world, I would say, right? DD, you know, in China. I can share with you because I went there. I didn't ask them for data. I didn't ask them for anything. I just went there to call me professor. I hang out with them. I can share with you. Within the corporate headquarters, all right, still 10,000 people. The entire operation is very much just like a traditional firm, you know, just the, you know, going back to Chandler, a lot of politics, you know, resource allocation or things like that. Of course, in terms of specific operations, right, I'm not saying which one is more important. You know, that's a little more like, oh, you know, create some 
gamification or, you know, that's very much information system. I'm, I'm not saying information system not important. I'm just saying, you know, for, for strategy research, we don't want to forget rather the core, you know, mission, right? So for us, you know, co a corporate adjustment, right? Uh, or, or, you know, corporate scope and the boundaries uh, in general, right? So, uh, you know, I think, again, going back to my personal bias, I, I tend to prefer to think deeper, right? And, and then, of course, we embrace new phenomena. For example, you, you know, a global value chain reconfiguration, right? So Trump and the President Xi are fighting, you know, it's, uh, you know you, 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 I mean, recent, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, work, right? Dissertation work, uh, you know, by, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Yulia, you know, um, Jasmina, or, you know, and, and also even for human resources, I think uh, someone mentioned just now, a lot of opportunities here, right? You know, in Europe, I heard this data, you know, can track almost like individuals, right? So traditionally, you know, let's say sociologists or maybe some entrepreneurship scholars uh, use that to study entrepreneurship. But for us, right, uh, let's say think about the corporate, uh, 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 you know, uh, corporate strategy, right? I mean, you know, uh, Julia, Christopher, you know, their work can capture the individuals, right? So uh, let's say middle managers or, or you know, senior managers, right? I, I, I think that's a great opportunity to study resource allocation because, you know, the employees, I mean, I, I don't want to be politically incorrect, but that's a, still a little bit generic, right? So it's like the, 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 the you know, senior people, the people who have experiences within the same organization, right? If we, we can capture the movement of that type of firm, and that's a huge empirical contribution, right? So anyway, so I, I you know, it, it's a, it, it, I, just in closing, I, I, I would say that, you know, my, my, um, yeah, I'm very privileged, right, to be on the same panel with Tim and, and, and Joe, and certainly there are, I'm so glad to see many other scholars uh, here uh, in this workshop. I, I, I still look forward to a, a discussion with, with this closed circle of uh, uh, scholars or scholarly friends. Uh, you know, I, I see with here my long-term friend and <laughs> yeah, so all here, right? like the PK, you know, the Guan, and in fact, Tammy, you know, I mean, that's, that's, um, you know, but also, you know, uh, just now I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, online platform, I'm not seeing online platform research not that important, right, so I'm poor, you know, try to connect both, you know, uh, you know, but still, you know, my favorite research topic on imitation industry dynamics, people here, like okay, Yuan, Jan, I mean, just, uh, you know, I, I certainly I cannot cover everyone. I'm just saying, you know, I look forward to the uh, interactions. Uh, all right, so that's, that's me. Yeah. yeah, I'm done. Thank you, or should I, I read it from the chat? Wendy? No? Well, uh, so when asked to, t uh, this is a question for team. So data collection on HR adjustment costs will be timely as many companies repurpose their employees as response to the COVID pandemic. Would you advise opportunities for data collection on these HR adjustment costs? Uh, I would advise them, yes. I don't have any ideas on how to get that data. You know, I saw a recent paper uh, where Rene Stoltz, who's a finance professor in Ohio State, was looking, it was kind of a follow-on to this Kupa Swami and Vialonga paper, at which, which looked at, um, uh, they looked at HR, uh, uh, you know, um, and they looked, no, I'm sorry, they didn't. I'm thinking of a different paper. I'm thinking of a Tate and Yang paper, but Kupa Swami looked at whether multi-business firms had flexibility advantages during crises. Then they look specifically at the finance uh, crisis in 2007, 2008, 2009. And they found that they, uh, they, these firms had a premium uh, relative to single business firm. And this Rene Stoltz paper looked around the pandemic and they found that um, multi-business firms uh, did better during the pandemic than single business firm. We need to be doing more research like this that's timely. I mean, this is, this is the year that, you know, the, you know, the crisis occurred. We, we need, I was, you know, 
we all have times in our career where we read a paper and we think, well, darn it, I wish I would have written that paper. That's the paper I wish I would have written. But I think there's still opportunities to, to study this. So uh, just wanted to draw your attention to that. Gwen, I don't have any specific information about how to get HR data. But Thank you me. might ask uh, Chris Poliquin and uh, Sh uh, Sh Jasmine Chauvin and then uh, Uya so Sol Solomon and uh, Sharon Bellinson, who have done work in, in human resource redeployment. Yeah, and we have Ulya here as well. So I will yeah. I will ask one question per speaker so that everyone has. The, the next question would be for Joe from Asim Kaul. Asim, would you like to read your question or do you want me to? Sure, um, I don't, actually it wasn't really a question. It was more a comment, Joe. Um, you know, it's interesting that you're talking about adjustment costs at the firm level, right? But I guess I always think of adjustment costs as being, e if not equally or not more, at the resource level. And so I was curious why firm versus resource and how you think about that. Yeah, I, I guess a, a lot, it may be just a function of a lot of my research over the years has been uh, thinking about firm boundaries and firm level as the unit of analysis. So I think I just, but, but I hear you. If, you, if you. if we go back to the Nelson and Winter book on, on, on the emphasis on experimentation uh, I, I absolutely agree with you that we also, you, you have, as a matter of fact, it might even help our paper for Hunsu and I to revisit our whole paper and, and think about it from, uh, a, a, a matter of fact, I would say it's a more traditional connection to Nelson than even we have in the paper. And that is, if we think about the routine as a unit of analysis and then work through uh, some of the logic in our paper from that perspective, I think that, that's a terrific idea. And then just maybe one other, I don't know who, I don't have the chat thing here, but I looked at it a, a minute ago. The, the other person who wrote was, uh, what about stakeholder theory and adjustment costs? And I think that's a fantastic question. So any researcher working on uh, stakeholder orientation, you can think about the adjustment costs. You can, on the plus side, you can think about the fact that lots of stakeholders can give you input into being more flexible, maybe getting more meaning out of your real options so a stakeholder orientation may very well play nicely into our paper back and going back to the firm level uh, and perhaps at the routine level. Uh, so that's a terrific question. On the other hand, the stakeholders uh, may also provide more constraints as well. So I think it's a terrific question to think about stakeholder orientation and, and how it affects both the learning on the ex experimentation side and the potential inertia through our COPE framework. Uh, so that's a, that was a fantastic so I, I, I think the contribution for this uh, session was really fantastic on both of those questions. One last thing I'd just like to say is I, I, I really love listening to Tim's uh, precision and I, I, I really enjoyed today um, Brian's enthusiasm about ideas. I, I always tell Brian he's kind of a role model for younger scholars. He just, he's just an ideas person. And I just thoroughly enjoyed his enthusiasm about ideas. I, I think for young people, if you have a whole lifetime of being enthusiastic about ideas, uh, you'll have a good career. Thank you so much, Joe. And then uh, we have, I think, uh, maybe time for one or two more questions. So the next one would be for Brian. So PK to ask a question, would you like to read it or do you want me to? Okay, so I, I can read it. So PK asks, Brian, glad to see value generation dem demand brought in as a driver of adjustment, not just adjustment cost, but in general, is there an assumption that locus of value generation is always the same as locus of investment? I can think of many ecosystem settings where uh, with significant complementarities where that assumption may not hold. I'm sorry, PK, would you like to, no, to add something? Fine. <laughs> oh, you, you said everything I wanted to say. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, that's for Brian. Way, I think we, we can stay here for uh, 10 more minutes. The system will automatically kick us out. So we, we don't need to worry. We can chat here. Uh, yeah, I have very thick skin. Uh, so <laughs> Anna, forgive me. Uh, 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 yeah, so I, I think, uh, in fact, our uh, paper with the Vikas Agawo very much 
I mean, it's not the ecosystem, but the build on this idea, right? So we look at, at the, you know, the locus of coronation, right? Essentially about the complementarities before 9-11, the shock, right? So the value creation locus, per your notion, right? So, and then the impact on the, you know, adaptation challenge after the shock, right? It's the indirect answer to your question, but the, and the, I haven't thought through, but, but I, I would imagine, right? So there are different possible combinations, uh, you know, value creation and probably value capture too, right? And then complementarities, right? So I think the precision, a little bit to our same point, you know, I think going down, uh, you know, beneath the firm level, right? So look at the specific value creation activities, probably within ecosystem too. Uh, so yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, the, that's my thought, yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. So we had Dan Ross who had his hands hand raised. I, 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 I see that you already lowered your hand, but if you want to ask your question now. Yeah, yeah just quickly, it's probably more of a comment or something. So for, for Joe's paper, um, your goal was to combine adjustment costs and real options. And then there was a point where I realized that proposition one to four wasn't really about real options until you came then later with proposition five and six back to it. So I wonder whether that story could be stronger if you start with five and six, and then you go into the implication of whatever comes from proposition five and six, then you look into your propositions one, one to four, because that then you, you keep that connection to the real option story a little bit. It's, it's mm -hmm. more of a, a storytelling thing, but it also it would be consistent with combining the theories. I think I, uh, that's a very good uh, suggestion for us to think about. It, it kind of reminds me of like uh, Van de Ven's diamond model. You, you, you start, you can start at home plate and start with the problem and then go to the, go to the, the, the theory, then go to the research design and then do the solution. But his comment is you can start, you can start anywhere on the diamond and kind of work around because we do, it, it, it is, it is the, the positive feedback effect. So I, we, I, I don't think we've given a lot of thought to where we start the story. So that's really, so we got three really great, at least three great ideas from the three comments uh, today. So thank you. you no, know, I just, I just like to emphasize, I really like uh, that paper. That's really nice. And particularly the feedback loop that you have at the end. I think that's really a nice model. Uh, so congratulations to you and, and uh, your co No, We still need some reviewers to, <laughs> <laughs> our work, but, uh, it's, yeah, but but once again, I, I get it. Once again, I get excited about the papers themselves, and it, it, a good papers tend to find homes eventually. Sure. So we also have a question by Yang Sheng Du. Would you like to read your question or? Um, Yang so my question is how to integrate the behavior uh, behavior theory of the firm because we talk a lot about crisis. So it's more like a situational contextual factors. So how to integrate those two different types of theory. So can I see the behavior theory of the firm is more fundamental, it's more about the firm design, uh, but the um, contextual or situational factors are more like a test to test the system's robustness. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And just a quick thought there. I, I, I haven't thought extensively about this. Um, I, but I, this idea of this redeployment threshold, um, there's quite a bit of correlation between that and any sort of aspiration, uh, you know, level construct that you might devise. And so uh, I could see some work trying to tease apart, you know, how the aspiration is different from the redeployment threshold there. Uh, I don't know much that has done, done that. Uh, I see there's a few behavioral theory people on the, on the line though, and I will point out that uh, um, uh, Dovev Lavi uh, actually contributed to the special issue on redeployment. So he's probably thought about this more extensively than I have. But, but in general, I, I, I don't see much of the behavioral literature kind of diving into these rational explanations, alternative explanations. Uh, and I'm a bit biased, but uh, I'd like to see more work in that one. 
Also, I would just add that in our COPE framework, the, the O in COPE is organizational, and, and, and much of that is from Syrett and March and March and Simon and, the, and also Leventhal and behavioral theory. One other comment I, I would make about that is uh, if you go back to the debate of uh, an AMR between uh, Adner and Leventhal and uh, Kogut and, and uh, who I always have trouble with his name, the person from Boston University who begins with the letter K, <laughs> Kutalaka. Kula Talaka. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the 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 the, the uh, Koget at all paper is, is a, as Tim Fulton noted is it's a it's a rational actor model of what firms should do, and the Adner Leventhal paper is about how firms actually behave and they may not behave in the way that. So, but but the thing I would say about both of those papers is when I read both of them, I agree with each of them. I mean, there's not a winner in that, to my mind. In other words, if, you're, if, you're, if your objective is to talk about description in the real world, I think Adner and Leventhal are right on target. But if, you're, if your focus is about, is, about, uh, is about what managers should do, I think the, the uh, rational actor model is better. And then I guess we, we kind of get a little bit into the CUNE idea of incommensurability. There's a, there's a little bit of a challenge of trying to bring together the behavioral bounded rationality simultaneously with the model of uh, perfect rationality and then and how do we constructively put those two together to give advice for managers. So I, I think you're on target uh, about thinking about uh, what is the role of the behavioral limitations for real world decision making when we bring in experimentation and real options. We try to deal with that a little bit with the COPE framework but once again, there are some incommensurabilities about that that are just really difficult to, to have a perfectly satisfactory answer. I, I'm kind of reminded of Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra said one time, I wish I knew an answer to your question because I'm tired of answering that question. It's a little bit of humor, Yogi Berra humor there, I think. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of our attendants. Um, so this session will be uploaded to the SMS site. I think that it will be kicking us out at 1240. Uh, but I really appreciate your engagement, your questions, and of course, the wonderful presentation by the presentations by the panelists. Okay.